Does the car have a microwave in it? Is there a stove in there that I don't know about? Okay, I know that you could bring the... Let me shut up, because I ain't trying to tell y'all how to do crack. That's what you won't do. You won't come on here and, and flag my video for telling y'all how to make crack. That won't happen. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, tell a friend, and visit Up Top Beauty. Today's accessory is my Leona bangles. Ooh, it's only two left, guys. Make sure you run over to uptopbeauty.com and get you a bundle. And if you are not already a part of our book club, please remember to hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes you, can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's talk about George Clinton's brothers be yo like George ain't that funkin' kinda hard on you. I think this is part, ooh, uh, I don't know, my bad, my bad. Man, Tom Joyner been around a long effing time, longer than what I ever thought. You know, I knew his old ass been around for a while, but damn, not this long. But anyway, once Sly and I were playing a show, and when we went on stage, Tom Joyner came and stole our pipes. When we came back afterwards, he was standing there holding the pipes upside down, draining them, which is a crackhead sin. Thank you for acknowledging that you are actually a crackhead. Lots so, of people tried to be like Sly. Take Rick James. More than half of the shit he did was a direct imitation. But there were only two people who were capable of that kind of cool. Miles Davis and Sly. Uh, tell me what y'all think. Do y'all think Rickety James was trying to imitate Sly? I don't. Oh, then let me tell you this other story about Sly, okay? So one time, George Clinton and Sly were coming off tour, okay? They at the airport, right? This woman in a wheelchair was like, oh, Sly, I love you, I love you, okay? Sly go over there, hug her. George Clinton said that it's very rare that Sly ever puts his guards down, right? But he went over there and he hugged the person. And the person in the wheelchair had said to him, it's about time that you get your shit together. People think just because you're a public figure that you can say whatever it is that you want to say to people, to public figures, okay? Then when we clap back, y'all be like, well, I just asked the question, and uh, why are you so hostile? Now, getting back to Sly. Sly jerked away from the lady and was like, fuck you, bitch. Sly and I were different when it came to drugs, okay? What George said about, um, what is that, Sly? Was that Sly, he went, 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 smoked, did, you know, puffed, huffed, whatever it is he could do until he passed out. He was balls through the wall. George Clinton say that he tried to never get strung out. You doing crack and you trying to never get strung out? I got high, but I tried never to get strung out. I wanted to go to bed at a time that made sense so that I could work the next day. And I hated the idea of using down to the bone and then jonesing for more. Sly operated at the other extreme. He would party until everything was gone and then use tactics to resupply himself. You know, like them goops. Armed with our artists, we sent our lawyers, Ina Mibach, and our managers, Lieber and Krebs, to get a deal, and they came back with an offer from CBS. 
As I was getting ready to sign a deal, it occurred to me that I was already committed to something like 17 other albums. Releases from Parliament and Funkadelic, of course, Bootsy's record projects with The Brides and The Parliament, The Horny Horns, a solo album with Eddie Hazel, and more. Tracy, my son, was an incredible, prolific lyric writer. I had production and arrangement wizards like Junie and also Ron Dunbar, who had overseen The Brides. I was sure that we could do it. Archie, Nene, and I were now running a record label, and we went to seal the deal with Walter Yetnikoff, the head of CBS, and Dick Asher, who had been brought over from Polygram to CBS as deputy president. Uncle Jam got rolling. We released the Sweatband record. We released Felipe Wynn's solo record, Wynn Jammin'. Third up was Roger Troutman. Oh, he's a nigga. He's a, keep your eye on him, cause he's a ninja. We were already familiar with Roger, not just because he had worked with Funkadelic, but because he and his family band, Zap, were signed to Warner Brothers. In 1979, they were working on their debut for Warner Brothers, which included a song called Funky Bounce. Someone, maybe Roger himself, maybe Bootsy, who was working with them, brought me the track. Now don't forget, Bootsy and his brother, um, I forget his name, was it Fish Head or, you know, Fish Bait? What was it, Fishy? Damn y'all, correct me down below, cause y'all love to do that. Was it Fish? Catfish, that was his name, Catfish, okay? So Bootsy and his brother Catfish grew up with Roger Troutman and his brothers, okay? So that's another way that uh, the dude, Roger Troutman and Zap came into the fold of the whole P-Funk June. After more bounce to the ounce, more bounce to the ounce. After more bounce to the ounce, we started in on Roger's solo album. The song that I thought would be a single was a cover. I heard it through the grapevine, and there was another strong track called So Rough, So Tough. Of all those early Uncle Jam's records, Roger's record was the one that I thought had the most commercial potential. Roger seemed to think so too. The release date drew closer. One night, I got a frantic phone call from someone at United Sound Studio. Roger's masters aren't here, they said. He had come in and said he needed to take them out so that he could add horns in Ohio. Well, you know that's where Bootsy and Roger are from, Ohio. And the studio released the tapes to him. They shouldn't have. He didn't own them. But our stuff was fairly loose. We were running cross town regularly. It wasn't that odd for masters to go from one studio to another. I called around until I located them. They were over at Warner Brothers, where Roger himself had taken them. He was planning to put them out with Warners. Oh, you did you, you! In short, Warner Brothers released the album, and it was the same exact album that we had intended to release for Uncle Jam. It had the same title, The Many Faces of Roger. Bob Krasnow came over to talk to me in Los Angeles. I was staying at the Beverly Cornstalk. You're a label now, he said. This is just business. I raised hell and expected CBS to do the same, but they didn't fight very hard, which made it clear that the backing I thought we had was more of a figment of my imagination. When Roger's tapes mysteriously disappeared from United Sound, other things began to come apart at the seams as well. When we turned in the new Funkadelic album to Warner Brothers, it included the tracks that I had been working on with Sly. I got in advance, but found that it didn't go as far as it used to, both because we were doing so much recording and because the drugs were getting more expensive. Out there in Los Angeles, working on sessions, trying to piece together various projects, I suddenly felt stranded without any real source of support, okay? But that's what crack will do for you, okay? Now let me tell you about what happened at the Denny's. The Denny's, yes, the Denny's. Sly and um, Georgie Poole is out front of the Denny's smoking crack in their car. Deciding who to trust was complicated by the fact that I was high nearly all the time. One night, Sly and I drove out and sat in the car in front of a Denny's for an hour or so, waiting for the dealer. 
Sly was right there preparing all the drugs, okay? He said that Sly had all the tools to turn the coke into crack. How is that? Does the car have a microwave in it? Is there a stove in there that I don't know about? Okay, I know that you could bring the... Let me shut up, because I ain't trying to tell y'all how to do crack. That's what you won't do. You won't come on here and, and flag my video for telling y'all how to make crack. That won't happen. Meanwhile, the people in Denny's had been watching us sitting there for so long that their suspicions were aroused. Snitches. Snitches. You don't know how to mind your business? I see people sitting in the parking lot. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Hold on, y'all. So look, I'm going to the left and then I'm going to come back, right? Ooh, I love sitting in the parking lot being nosy. Ooh, I love that, right? So anyway, y'all know I go get like Dunkin' Donuts every morning. Well, just about every morning because I had to come back, cut back on my coffee, caffeine intake because I got acid reflux real bad, y'all. But anyway, I was sitting out there in the Dunkin' Donuts, right? Just, I guess, talking to my sister or something, right? So I'm sitting in the parking lot, right? Get ready to get out, go get my coffee, my iced coffee, right? So then I started seeing this girl walk from one car to another car, back to the first car, to the second car. And I'm saying, what the fuck is going on here? She had on like these little biker shorts and like this wig. It didn't look like a lace front. If it was a lace front, it wasn't tied down or it wasn't glued down or something because it was like flipping. The lace was flipped up. Like one of these dudes is her pimp, okay? One of these dudes is definitely her pimp because she had to get the money, get out the car, give it to the dude, and then she got back in the next car, and then she drove around somewhere with the dude. I'm like, oh, she is selling pussy or, or mouth. So, you know, I'm not going to be like this, uh, police, yeah, uh, they ran here selling pussy at the Dunkin' Donuts. I think y'all might need to come over here and check something out. That's not my judge. That's not what I'm going to do because I've been taught, okay, as a black American, mind your business okay mind your business hey, i don't know but mind your business all right because i don't have time to be getting shot or maimed or punched in the eye or slapped in the mouth for some bitch i don't know someone made a call and as we drove out of the lot the police met us coming in the car was so cloudy from crack smoke that they couldn't really see in but we saw them clear as day I broke the pipe and put the remaining drugs in my mouth. When the windows went down, they recognized us, and they sat us on the curb and mocked us. If it isn't Sly Stone and Dr. Funkenstein, they went through the car, found nothing, but managed to get an old fragment of a pipe from Sly's trunk. It was enough to hold us overnight. The next morning, a friend of Sly's came down and got us out. Jail wasn't a pleasure. I know it's not, but child, that's a part of life. When you smoking the crack, you go to the jail. In the midst of all the chaos, another Funkadelic record came out. The funny thing was that I had nothing to do with it. Fuzzy, Calvin, and Grady did. They had left the band numerous times before. Grady usually came back, but the other two stayed away. Finally, Grady left for good too. The concept of the band had moved beyond them, at least in their mind. They didn't feel there was room for the parliaments in the P-Funk world. They created their own band on the side, hooked up with a producer named Jerry Goldstein and cooked up the idea that they were still Funkadelic that the three of them somehow had rights to the name. Because we know other bands have done that easily, okay? They'll be like, okay, it's one of me. I'm about to tour. It's at, at, at two, you know? We know the Temptations did it, you know? But they, I think they toured as the lead singers of the Temptations. But there was definitely times where it was two, tem two groups of Temptations out there on the road making money separately. And let me give kudos to New Edition. One thing that I will say about them is that you've never heard them go out on the road and have like two new additions, you know, because it was so many different, you know, offsprings from new edition that it was possible for those people to just use their own names, right? But you never, ever, like I've never seen a tour where Ralph Tresvant was not on the tour, a new edition tour where Ralph Tresvant was on the tour. So although from what I understand, there are, there's a lot of chaos in the band, the boys are still, or the guys are still very respectful of the name New Edition, and they make great effort not to destroy the name, okay? So that's one thing that I will love 
always about the new addition. They cooked up the idea that they were still Funkadelic, that the three of them somehow had rights to the name. And then they went and released the album called Connections and Disconnections, which came out in Europe in 1980, and then in the United States in 1981. Well, George Clinton said that although, you know, there were times that they bumped into each other while at a studio, on the street, on a tour, something like that, he still had admiration for them and love for them, and it wasn't a thing like, hey, man, you stole the name, I, I, I. But when you have the original people there using the name also, I mean, how much can you say? And plus, George said he still loved those people very much. So if you still love them, why attack them? When we came back to Detroit after Roger's deflection, there was a cloud of stink around us. It was difficult to find musicians to work with us. People kept their distance. You know why? Because you can't. You 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 were a difficult band. Okay, we got uh, the Parliament Funkadelic going through problems with their labels. You know, Roger Trump, Troutman, then Goop Jaw just stole the money right up from underneath you, and then took it over there to Warner. And you got drug issues. How the hell the leader gonna have drug issues? You think people gonna feel comfortable? As a musician, going to y'all be like, hey, I want to work with the Parliament Funkadelics. No, answer no. And you got band members leaving? Right now you got two Funkadelics? Come on. You can't blame the people for wanting to stay the hell away from you, Georgie Poole. By 1980, there was a division in the P-Funk world between the people who could put up with Nene and those who could not. His talent for rubbing people the wrong way extended beyond the band. We used to go to an El Salvadorian nightclub on Sunset Boulevard where the Cubans hung out, okay? Now, I don't quite understand this, you know, why you mad at uh, Nene for this, but anyway, Nene had got this dude to stay up all night with him smoking crack, okay? Come on, man, come on, man. You can hit it again, you can hit it again. That's what uh, Nene was egging the guy on to do. The dude ended up having a heart attack from over smoking crack, okay? And I'm saying to myself, well, who, who problem is that? Who, 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 who is responsible for that? Because can't nobody tell me, oh, hold on, y'all. I'm gonna go to the left and I'm gonna come back. Give me two minutes, okay? But anyway, I was messing with this dude. I was so enamored with this dude, okay? I mean, so enamored. He looked like Ice Cube. He was during my college days when Ice Cube was the shiz at the time, okay? I think America's Most Wanted had just came out not too long ago, right? And um, I was so enamored with him, you know? And he wasn't really nothing special. It was just that, you know, he knew how to get my body there and he looked like Ice Cube, right? But when we was together, this dude tried to tell me, you know, you can't be with me unless you smoke weed. With me and you will never be together. Back then, I was everywhere, you know? I was young, I think I was probably like 19 years old, infatuated with a mother hunchy that, you know, plays mind games. It was cool to him to make women go crazy over him. And child, when I'm telling you, that dude had the power to make a woman go crazy all in his mouth. Okay. And then after the dude went into the hospital of a heart attack, Nene came to visit him and started ragging on his ass about almost dying from smoking crack. Yeah, Ninja, I told you you couldn't hang. Yeah, I told you, man. Man, you almost died on me, man. You almost died. And the dude is looking at him like, as soon as I get out of this hospital, I'm gonna throw that nigga's body. As manipulative as Nene was, he was still effective, which is why I was slow to harden against him. Plus, I saw the way he tweaked authority. My style was different, but the aim was sometimes the same. And how people was infatuated by his aggressiveness and daring was amazing. David Carradine, this ninja, hold tight. David Curdine was one of his best friends, and the two of them would set up a meal, get all the food on the table, and then pee on it. Don't okay. forget, David Curdine is the same dude that liked to spank his monkey while hanging from the ceiling, okay? Don't forget that. I was kind of taken back when I heard that and this, that David Curdine was off the chain so much like that because I was like, not my kung fu. So moving forward, mm -hmm, but then moving back, 
The record that I turned in just before Sly and I were busted outside of the Denny's was Electric Spanking of War Babies. It came out in August of 1981. At the time, it was hard to see the whole chessboard. When you're fucked up on crack, you function from behind a thickening smoke screen. Whenever I had an inkling that something was amiss, I discounted it to be 60% at least. I figured that more than half of what I was thinking was coming directly from the drugs and the paranoia, right? Because if crack can't give you nothing else, you know, besides, I think they said it was like three minutes of fun or maybe 10 minutes of fun, something like that. It will give you paranoia. Now, if you have not already done so, please remember to like, share, and subscribe because it is so important to our success here on the YouTube. And remember this, the same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down, my naysayers, my patron loves. You babies, have a good one. Peace. Never learn.